Welcome to this week's World Stories. The plight of the Rohingyas. How digitalization will change our lives. But first to London and the survivors of Grenfell Tower. At least 80 people were killed there this summer when a fire raged through their building. Now families of the victims say their loved ones died because they were poor and had no one to lobby for them. Music to heal a scarred community. A street piano in a makeshift meeting space just opposite the burnt out tower block. Neighbours feel the need to stick together. Many here witnessed the fire and heard the screams of victims trapped inside the building. Yvette Williams lives nearby. She knows some of the people who perished in the inferno. Moses' his funeral was um, about four weeks ago. A real character in the area, um, with a little dog. Um, very wise man. Um, but a lot of fun too, so very sad. And again, no remains for Moses. No, no remains? No remains. People who live here speak of before and after Grenfell. The tower casts a shadow over the neighborhood. Police are still recovering remains. Some victims may never be properly identified. Yvette and others have set up a charity to see justice for the survivors. Much of their criticism is directed against the local council who own the tower and who they say neglected to maintain the building properly and ensure safety standards. We really want to see some criminal prosecutions coming out of this. We want to see individuals named. I mean, our ultimate aim um, in terms of justice is that this situation is never allowed to happen again um, and it actually changes um, the landscape of, you know, government legislation corporate massacre, that's what local people accuse the council of. And while many here seem doubtful of seeing anyone held to account properly, they do hope that the tragedy has opened people's eyes. Those people shouldn't be able to die in vain and that since so a big thing happened, it should change, you know, how social housing is cared for because at the moment it's been neglected for. I hope it will change the way that the authorities see the people that seemingly, when this fire happened, didn't matter. Because everybody matters. It will take several months for an interim report to be published. One thing is for sure, for people who live around the burnt out tower block, the tragedy has changed their life completely. Hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims have been forced to flee Myanmar since violence erupted there in August. A textbook example of ethnic cleansing, says the UN. Conditions for those who make it to Bangladesh are dire. They keep on coming. More than 410,000 refugees from Myanmar have already crossed the border into Bangladesh. And no one knows how many will still arrive. In the camps, the situation is already at a breaking point. Food, water, shelter, everything is scarce here. Many of the aid deliveries are organized by private Bangladeshi citizens. If we do not help the government of Bangladesh, this problem will be difficult to solve. The refugees are getting increasingly desperate. And distributing the aid to those who really need it can't be done from the back of a truck. Some 40 kilometers north lies the hospital of Cox's Bazar, the district capital. Here, doctors are treating around 30 Rohingya refugees with severe injuries. They have sustained burns, broken limbs, and gunshot wounds. The hospital only has 250 beds and was already overstretched before the refugees arrived. And this um, influx uh, due to the occurrence in the Myanmar has been a great burden to us because these patients are huge in number, diverse in injuries, uh, difficult to manage injuries, some uh, infected cases, old cases are coming. So uh, with the existing resources, existing medicine, existing manpower, it has been very difficult for us to deal with this influx. Outside the hospital, Locals voiced their resentment towards the Rohingya refugees. 
Because of the Rohingya, our country is suffering greatly. Many of them break the law, they steal, they rob us, and the women work as prostitutes. We don't go to the hospital. Here is 85% or 90% Rohingya here. So we don't get the service here, hospital. We go to the other, other service center, we don't get them. We, local people don't get the service in our country. Back in the camps, Bangladeshi authorities are trying to manage the chaos. The government has designated an area to house 400,000 refugees where aid can be properly distributed. But with hunger and illness spreading, it's a race against time. Now for a glimpse of the brave new world of tomorrow. We wanted to find out how virtual reality might affect us when it becomes part of everyday life. So we went shopping in the future. Oh wonder. I'm out on a futuristic shopping trip. This virtual bird is my digital shopping assistant. It doesn't know much yet, but it learns quickly. Maybe in the future you'll walk into a store and we'll already know what you've come for, if the customer wants us to. We could offer targeted products, maybe ones you don't know yet, but would like. When does customer service become product marketing? Lots of questions, but at least it's very entertaining. And I still can't quite believe it. Digitalization changes the way we live, and in Berlin, there's plenty of room for fresh ideas and new startups. Like N26, the first German digital bank. Valentin Stalf, one of the founders, explains how I can open an account on my smartphone in just eight minutes. I just logged in with my fingerprint. As you see, I'm definitely making use of the overdraft service. So I can see the transactions here. I can tell how much I spent on shopping, for example. Then I can decide if it was too much. I have an exact overview of what I've spent. Sounds good, but the digital bank collects lots of valuable customer data. Algorithms tick away in the background, analyzing and learning who we are. So I'm going to try and open the virtual door. It's like I'm inside the car and I can decide how I want it to look. The gear stick should be around here somewhere. You can certainly sell or offer the customer a lot more extras with this system. I also get dizzy when I see how digitalization has changed our lives. And shopping is just the tip of the iceberg. Finally, we meet John Alan Namu, a journalist from Kenya. He knows what it's like to be under fire and chase after drug dealers, but that doesn't stop him from continuing to expose crime and corruption wherever he finds it. Investigative journalists who question those in power often put themselves at serious risk. Yet this is the path Kenya's John Allen Namu has chosen in his quest for the truth. We've been working on a story on corruption um, to do with traffic uh, in the city and it's a collaboration again with uh, a lot of people who've been working behind the scenes giving us uh, hidden camera footage just to show how corruption perpetuates itself um, with regard to the public transport system, specifically Matatus. The privately owned Matatu minibuses are a $1 billion business, and allegations have long swirled that corrupt police officers are profiting from it. The concern is that corruption has driven up transport prices. This is just one example of John Allen Namu's risky reports. I think the fear comes after the story starts to be unveiled because there are a lot of people who will be affected by it, there are a lot of people who will be exposed, and these are people with means to hurt, um, if not us, the people on the ground, the people who've been helping us with this footage. 
Namu founded Africa Uncensored eight years ago. He covers a wide range of issues on his YouTube channel, including corruption, terrorism, drug trafficking, and organized crime. His documentaries and reports have earned him recognition and respect, both locally and around the world. When, for instance, he looked into the death of a high-ranking Kenyan minister in a mysterious helicopter crash in 2012, he began receiving threats. We felt that there was an attempt to stifle the space of journalists. And personally, because I've always wanted to do this and, and tell stories that I, I have a personal input in seeing that they are important. So that's how Africa Uncensored started. John Allen Namu closely collaborates in his work with his wife, Sheena Makina, a video editor. But whenever he is out on assignment, she says she wonders whether taking such risks for the sake of transparency is worth it. It's rewarding to me personally because I feel that I'm, I'm doing something that's impactful in the long run. It might not be, um, it might not be recognized today or even tomorrow, but in the long run I think my entire body of work will stand for something and that's what fulfills me. John Allen Namu's story about Kenya's minibus taxis sparked a lively debate after it aired. And with Kenya ranked as one of the most corrupt countries in the world, it's unlikely he will soon run out of work. <laughs>